Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to this Litchfield Stakes fireside that we're having this evening with our guest speaker, brother Bruce H. Porter. And it really is uh, a privilege to welcome him this evening. My name is Mark Hamilton. I'm the stake president in the Litchfield Stake. And we're going to begin this evening's proceedings by having a word of prayer from Sister Lisa Cope of the uh, Wolverhampton Second Ward. Our dear me, Father, we're so grateful to be together this evening for this fireside. We're grateful to Brother Porter for coming to speak to us and we're grateful for his knowledge and for the gospel in our lives. We ask a blessing upon us this evening that we will feel of thy spirit and that we will be able to listen to the many words prepared for us and enjoy um, spending time with Brother Porter this evening. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Cope. Um, just pre-fireside, I, I asked Brother Porter, he's, he's got an extensive biography on his uh, website and uh, he, he, he's a very humble man, very modest and uh, I've got his permission just to read a little bit about uh, some of the things he's done, so I'll do that now. Brother Porter has done extensive research for the BYU's Religious Centre on the Pearl of Great Price and the Book of Abraham and been instrumental in the research and discovery of the Antonio Lobola will. He has done scriptural research in the major museums and libraries of Europe, the Middle East and the United States. But the Porter has presented papers for the Society of Early Historic Archaeology, the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, and has also co-authored a paper by study and also by faith, a two volume work honoring Hugh Nibley. During his graduate work, he assisted in the research and writing of a documentary on Egyptian archaeology for BBC. Brother Porter is also the author of many books, which titles include Prophecies and Promises, The Book of Mormon and Everlasting Decree, The Threshing Floor of Faith, and others. It's my privilege now to hand over the time to Brother Porter. Thank, thank you, Pre thank you, President. I really appreciate that. It's uh, uh, an honor and an opportunity to be here and speak so far away at the same time. I, uh, you'll find out that I love the gospel and I love the scriptures. Uh, I've done a lot of research in the scriptures and have come to the understanding uh, that the scriptures are the best commentary on the scriptures. They always are and always always will be. Um, um, I've, I have uploaded uh, these slides, all of the slides that I'm going to put on here. I know they're going to be recorded, but I have um, uploaded them to my website uh, uh, last night so that you can, if you want to see the slides, there, there'll be no audio, but the slides will be there if you want to download them. It's on, on, they're on PDF so they can be downloaded or printed. So, well, I'm going to start the presentation right now, and it's going to be dealing with uh, the Book of Abraham and the Gospel in Egypt. Now, I'm just going to talk a, a little bit about uh, some of the issues with Abraham, which is uh, uh, dealing with some of the uh, anti-Mormon uh, or those that are losing their faith because of the book of Abraham and the translation, uh, which is the main issue. And then I'm going to jump into the gospel in Egypt. So there's really kind of two, two presentations, one smaller than the other, and we're just going to barely touch on what's there. So I am going to share my screen right now. I'm hoping it's coming through. If it isn't, then let me know. But I'm going to be dealing with the book of Abraham. And in the book of Abraham, the target for most um, uh, anti-Mormons and many of those leaving the church is, is facsimile number two, and that has become the target. Ever since the book of Abraham was published, it's, it's been it's it's been one of those targets that a lot of people argue with uh, faith and with Joseph Smith and his ability to translate. Um, so I want to deal a little bit with the uh, Book of Abraham and translation. Now this translation process uh, includes that which uh, the same way uh, that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Abraham or the Book of Abraham as well as the uh, Book of Mormon as well as other things that he gave us translations for. Um, 
the questions that are, are always there, why doesn't the Book of Abraham translation match up with the Egyptologist uh, translations? Or there are, uh, they are no more, and they say they are no more than magical funerary texts often buried with the dead and have nothing to do with the translation of Joseph Smith. Well, they, do, they really do have something to do with the translation, um, but the exact translations are not there, and there's a reason for that. In 1967, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, there were 11 fragments of papyrus found they, that were discovered to be the Joseph Smith papyri. Now, how the museum got it is a long story, and that's for another presentation, but uh, these, these uh, 11 fragments are from what's called the uh, Book of Breathings. Um, you have different texts, religious texts in Egypt. You have the pyramid texts, uh, and that's abridged into the coffin text. The coffin texts are abridged into the Book of the Dead, and the Book of the Dead is abridged into, into what's called the Book of Breathings or the Sen Sen Papyrus, um, and all for the sake of money because of the cost of, of, of creating these documents. And they're all religious documents, and each one of the, all, all of these documents, all, all four uh, different types are how a person is to get from this life into exaltation and the things that are needed in order to do that. And the Joseph Smith papyri are from the Sen Sen papyrus. They were actually used as a cheat sheet for those going through the temple, for some people going through the temple, but they were discovered in 67. Um, uh, the, the Metropolitan Museum had them. This particular papyrus you're seeing here from the Book of Abraham is actually a facsimile from the Book of Joseph. Joseph Smith translated not only the book of Abraham, but the book of Joseph. And this is one of the facsimiles from the book of Joseph um, that we, um, uh, from the manuscript of the book of Joseph. Um, Joseph Smith's word for translation, and he, when he used the word translation, was that if there was a text that was ancient but real, uh, a document or a text rendered into English language, that's the definition of translation. Any ancient text, um, real document that's rendered into a different language is considered a translation. Um, the Book of Mormon, um, in the opening pages of the Book of Mormon, it says the ancient record thus brought forth from the earth as the voice of the people speaking from the dust and translated into modern speech by the gift and power of God as attested by divine affirmation. So that's, Joseph called the Book of Mormon a translation. Uh, in DNC 7, there was a parchment hit up by John, and it's a revelation given to Joseph Smith, the prophet, and Oliver Cowdery at Harmony, Pennsylvania, in April 29, when they inquired through the Urim and Thummim as to whether John, the beloved disciple, tarried in the flesh or had died. The revelation, this is what it says in our DNC, the revelation is a translated version of the record made on parchment by John and hidden up by himself. So even though Joseph didn't have the, the, the parchment, uh, he receives a revelation and gives us a translation of that revelation of a parchment. Even the book of Moses that we have in our Pearl of Great Price is described by Joseph as an extract from the translation of the Bible as revealed to Joseph Smith the prophet. The Joseph Smith translation, or J JST, even though Joseph had a Bible, it's the inspired version. We call that the inspired version, but Joseph still calls it a translation because it is an ancient record. And uh, not that he's translating directly from, from ancient documents, but it is an ancient record. The book of Abraham, um, Joseph puts at the beginning of this, uh, a translation of some ancient records that had fallen into our hands from the catacombs of Egypt. The writings of Abraham while he was in Egypt called the book of Abraham written by his own hand upon papyrus. Now, again, Joseph is calling that a translation. If it was an ancient record, Joseph Smith called it a translation because it was a translation, even if the translation was given him, given to him by the gift and power of God, uh, given to him by revelation. The fact that it was an ancient record at one time made it, by definition, a translation if it's given to us in English. And we see this in all of these that we just talked about. The Book of Mormon is a translation of an ancient record. The parchment hit up by John is a translation by, of an ancient record. The Book of Moses is a translation of Genesis. Uh, the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible is called a translation, and the book of Abraham is called a translation. Now, they're called translations because they were an ancient text at one time, not because he's reading intellectually off the documents. If it's a revelation of an ancient text, it's still a translation. Joseph would not have been able to translate the catalyst the same as one trained in ancient languages. 
We see even in the Book of Mormon, Moroni couldn't translate the Jaredite plates. He used the Urim and Thummim or interpret interpreters to provide the revelatory translation of ether. He had to do it by the gift and power of God also. Uh, and so Joseph does the same thing with his, with his fourth grade education or fourth level education. Uh, his wife, Emma Smith, said that he could not form a complete sentence correctly. And so he's doing it by the gift and power of God. This, uh, an intellectual translation would, would take on a whole different uh, um, form if you were to do it intellectually. And an intellectual type of translation, Joseph Smith could not do, and nor should we even expect it from Joseph Smith. He couldn't do it, and we shouldn't expect it from Joseph Smith because it was by the gift and power of God. When he lost the 116, or when Martin Harris lost the 116 pages, uh, Joseph was was distraught over that and comes into the house, and Emma tells him or says to him, why don't you just translate it again? Joseph immediately stated that the Lord had taken. I have lost the power to translate. He knew he couldn't do it. He knew he couldn't do it without the power, without the gift and power of God. So a translation, the revelation can't precede a thoughtful question. And this is why we see Joseph either, either using the Urim and Thummim or what's called the seer stone and placing his hat, his face in the hat with the seer stone. So there has to be a catalyst. Revelation and revelatory is a catalyst. If there, there's an old Jewish uh, statement in the Talmud that says there's no stirring above until there's a stirring below. You don't bless the food on an empty table before you've prepared the food. There has to be work. Uh, you have to be as prepared to ask the question as you are prepared to receive the answer. And so everything we do, any, any revelation always requires a catalyst when it comes from God. That's, that's just God... <laughs> The Lord doesn't give revelation or information ad hoc, just, just for no reason. There has to be a preparation. We do this ourselves. We, we go into our rooms or wherever we say our evening prayers at night, and we, we talk to the Lord about the catalysts of the day and what we need to accomplish and the inspiration that we need in order to, in order to deal with these catalysts, if we can call them that, the problems that might exist. Every section in the Doctrine and Covenants, every single one came to Joseph Smith because he went to the Lord first with a question. The first vision is because Joseph went with a question. Moroni appearing in his room is because he, he got on his near, knees asking if he was still worthy to participate in the work that was required. He goes to the, to the Susquehanna River because he's asking a question about baptism. Uh, he's asking questions about priesthood when that's restored. Um, every single section of the Doctrine and Covenants comes because there was a catalyst that caused a question in the mind of Joseph Smith. So this is the way revel revelation works. We see these catalysts. The question, which church is right? The first vision, I betook myself to prayer. That leads to the angel Moroni. The questions about baptism, John the Baptist, and the translation of the Bible. Uh, uh, leads to the real to the restoration of the church, not only the organization organization of the church, but the restoration of the priesthood. When Joseph is in Kirtland, the Lord tells him specifically. He says, "You need to get back on translating the Bible. You need to go back and start working on the on the um, inspired version of the Bible." Well, the reason the Lord wanted him to do that is because there were things that need to, needed to be revealed, but they couldn't be revealed until Joseph asked the question. Almost 60%, almost 60% of the Doctrine and Covenants is given while Joseph is in Kirtland because he's doing the translation of the Bible, which is raising questions in his mind. This, this is just one of those rules of revelation. We have to be as prepared to ask the question as we are prepared to receive the answer. So the catalyst always leads to the revelatory translation, the Bible in Genesis, the translation of Moses, the gold plates, the translation of the Book of Mormon, the questions about John, uh, was led to the parchment hit up by John, the Egyptian papyrus, led to the translation of the Book of Abraham. And these were all ancient records. Even though the catalyst might is there, the catalyst instills in the mind of Joseph Smith the questions that are necessary to lead to the revel revelations and the revelatory translations of these ancient documents. When the translation comes by revelation, there's no need to physically use the catalyst like the gold plates or the papyrus. 
the translation is by revelation. Emma said, Emma said that when Joseph was translating, that the plates, the gold plates, would be wrapped in a in a in a napkin or a cloth setting on the table. He wouldn't even look at it. He didn't need to look at it because he's not doing it intellectually. He's doing it by the gift and power of God. And he says that when he says, I've lost the power to translate. The book of Abraham is a revelatory translation of an ancient record too, an ancient record of Abraham. And they have found in, eight, in, in 1880s and 1890s, they found the Testament of Abraham and the Apocalypse of Abraham that is, that is closely connected to our book of Abraham. In 1978, they found, a, they found in Egypt, uh, Janet Johnson discovered in Egypt a lion couch bed uh, with a man on top of that bed. And in the Egyptian text, it described that man as being Abraham. That was in 1978. Well, the book of Abraham is a revelatory translation of an ancient record. The papyrus became the catalyst that prompted Joseph Smith to begin to ask the questions about who was in Egypt. And those questions led to the revelation that gave us the book of Abraham and the book of Joseph that was sold into Egypt. Therefore, the scholastic or intellectual translation of the papyrus catalyst should not and will not be the same as a revelatory translation of Abraham, and we shouldn't expect that. And a lot of people are losing their faith and testimony because they think that the papyrus doesn't say the same thing uh, that Joseph gives us in the book of Abraham. It's not supposed to. It's a catalyst. And you can look at this in a, in a simple way. If there was a book written in Greek, and you have this man by the name of Bill who can read Greek and speak English, and there's a guy by the name of Joe who wants to write the things down in this book, he listens to Bill's translation, and then Joe writes it down. Well, that's not any different. There's an ancient book of Scripture that can't be seen. And by the gift and power of God or by the Holy Ghost, Joseph Smith receives the revelation of the ancient text, and then Joseph writes it down. It is still a translation. Whether you read it directly from the text or you have the intellectual ability to translate it, it's still a translation because it's an ancient text. This is the same way that Moses provides us the book of Genesis. Moses is 13, over 1,300 years after the events of the book of Genesis. And there's only one way that he can give us that book of Genesis, and that's by the gift and power of God. Facsimile, too, is often the most targeted aspect of Abraham. Every ancient text, Joseph called a translation. However, the facsimiles found in the Book of Mormon, he does not call translations, and neither does Abraham. They're not called translations by Joseph Smith, and they're not called translations by Abraham or part of the text. They are called explanations by Joseph Smith, and Abraham calls them representations. Egyptian scholars have said about facsimile number two, and Klaus Baer has, has um, one of the best in the United States at one time, said, I can tell you what it says, but I can't tell you what it means. Joseph, on the other hand, giving us an explanation, is telling us what it means to Abraham, not what it says. And there are people losing their testimony over this, which is just is ridiculous. Abraham, in his book, calls the facsimiles as representations. Even in those opening chapters, he says that they tried to offer me as a sacrifice on an altar, and I will, and I will refer you to the representation at the beginning of this record. Even Abraham is using them as representations. Now, facsimile number two, and this isn't it. This is one from uh, the Asmolean Museum there in Oxford. It's uh, probably in the Oxford Museum now. I, I was doing research on Abraham and I got there in Oxford and, and they had just put this uh, facsimile out or this uh, hypocephalus out about two days before I got there on display. And it's very, very close to ours because ours has uh, a few, uh, uh, there were a few parts of it missing when it was, um, uh, when it was published in the Times and Seasons. But it is, it's a resurrection text. It's, a, it's called a resurrection and an ascension text. It talks, and I don't know whether you can see my cursor or not, but this one starts at the bottom. Ours starts at the top. But it goes back and it says, I am Jabati, I am Jabati, I am Chawet Ben Ben. I'm in the temple of Ben Ben, the very first temple, so exalted and so glorious. The power to procreate, I've become a mighty God in the temple of the ancient ones. And then it tells his name. His name is Tashri Khansa, who has been redeemed. So it's the resurrection text. And then it's the ascension text in the top part. 
This is the rakia, the bird there that's ascending through the heavens into perfection. And it talks about life, eternal life, and it talks about death and the grave down below. Uh, these are all, these are all, this is an aspect of what Abraham is trying to get across to us. Um, he's trying to tell, the, the, the record of Abraham, the record of Abraham is a record of his endowment. Those uh, chap, chapter one, verses two through four, Abraham is trying to tell us that, look, I wanted the endowment that the fathers had. I wanted to receive it. And I, I had to, I desired, I, I, I knew a lot. I possessed great knowledge, but I wanted to be possess greater knowledge so, so I could be a greater follower of righteousness. And so in that hypocephalus, in fact, simile number two, Joseph's, Joseph gives us an explanation of what these things represented to Abraham that's talked about in his, in his book. And Abraham is the only scripture that we have that's illustrated. It's a great thing. And these explanations are canonized. Uh, whether we understand them or not. So spend some time looking at it. And I'm just going to go through it. Just This is the explanation of facsimile number two. And I want to just kind of outline what it shows. It shows here that there is a place where God resides. Abraham is telling us not only his, is he available, but he's locatable. So he says there is a place where God resides. Next to that place is a, is a, is a, is a governing planet named Kolob that governs planets, and the Lord tells Abraham, like unto the one whereon thou standest. And Kolob is a governing planet, and, and it tells us in this explanation that Kolob is the last planet, uh, the last governing planet pertaining to time, because where God resides, there is no time. Uh, he can see the past, present, and future, and it tells us, Joseph tells us here that the, day, the, the days on Kolob, one day on Kolob, is as a thousand years on earth, and it's the last pertaining to the measurement of time, not where God is. It tells us also that Oliblish is another, another governing planet that has the same revolutions or the same time periods as Kolob. And then he goes on to explain in this that we get our life and light on earth through the medium of Kilfloesis which then passes that through the medium of K. Ivanrash, which then controls our son, Enishko Andash, and controlling 15 other fixed sons. And then we finally receive that light and life on earth, which is called Ja'o'e, and then Felice, the moon, reflects that light. So we can only see in space, we can only see very little of this. So anyway, Facsimile number two is not a translation. None of the facsimiles are. They are explanations. Anyway, that concludes the, the little translation part. And I'm going to move on to the gospel in Egypt. Now, this is where it begins to get exciting. And you need to know that I'm only going to just, I'm just going to touch on very little of what's there and what's available and what we can understand and see the, the part I didn't put in here is on the ritual embrace. And it is just, it's phenomenal. And, and, uh, <laughs> when you when you take LDS people to Egypt and you show them the ritual embrace and how much it shows up, uh, they are astounded that so much of a temple uh, would be on the walls uh, of Egypt. You have to understand Egypt, and we'll go through that. Egypt functioned; they copied. It says the first Pharaoh was a righteous man and earnest sought earnestly to imitate the order established in the days of the first patriarchal reign, even in the reign of Adam. And he can, and Egypt was founded upon the higher law, upon the religion of the patriarchs, not the Aaronic law, like in, like in the Old Testament, but the higher law. And so you will see these things in Egypt more than you will even in Israel. A man by the name of Budge, A.E. Wallace, E.A. Wallace Budge, he was the curator of the Egyptian Museum there in, uh, in London at the British Museum. He was a curator, and he did a lot of translations, not only in Egypt, but in Coptic and other things. He said, there was never a people more prepared to accept Christianity than were the ancient Egyptians, because he was able to recognize the connection between the New Testament and ancient Egypt. Uh, and he says, there was no one ever more prepared because of the myths of Egypt and the religion of ancient Egypt, there was never a people more prepared to accept Christianity. You may not realize it, but Egypt, after the time of Christ, Egypt was the first country to be totally Christian. Totally Christian. Uh, Philip, one of the apostles, went into Egypt. Uh, the Coptic church was established there. The oldest Jewish settlement 
uh, and temple was in Elephantine in Egypt, um, outside of Israel, uh, which dates back clear back to the time of uh, Lehi leaving Jerusalem. But there never was a people more prepared to accept Christianity, and there's reasons for that. Uh, we learned that this Egyptian and the and the hieroglyphs were even uh, the brass plates that Lehi takes from Jerusalem were written in Egyptian. We read in Mosiah 1, were it not possible that our father Lehi had remembered all these things to have taught them to his children? He couldn't have done it. He couldn't have taught these things except were for the help of these plates, for he having been taught in the language of the, of the Egyptians, therefore he could read the engravings, telling us that the brass plates were written in Egyptian. And because he used the scriptures and could read the scriptures, and they were his standard, he could teach them to his children so that they could teach them to their children in order that his posterity could fulfill, fulfill the commandments of God, even down to the presence of time, telling us the importance of scripture, uh, not just the Egyptian, but the importance of scripture. There's three great prophets that live in Egypt. You have Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. And we know Christ was there also, and there's a few other prophets that come down into there. But Abraham, uh, Joseph, and Moses each less, left us a record. We have the book of Abraham from Joseph Smith. We have the manuscript or the, or the book of Joseph that Joseph Smith uh, translated, the manuscript. It was never published or finished for translation. And a third of the book of Abraham was never prepared before his martyrdom. Joseph was actually working on two of, he was, he was working on the um, uh, manuscript for the book of Abraham and only got two, prepared two installments for publication and was martyred before he got the third installment done. And he had already done the book of Joseph translation, but he had not begun the preparation for publication uh, at the time of his death. So we have the book of Abraham, the book of Joseph, and obviously uh, Moses gives us uh, the book of Genesis as well as uh, uh, the whole Pentateuch, basically. So we have three great prophets, each with authority and power, each leaving us a record uh, Bringing, bring, to bring future generations unto God. The patriarchal religion of Egypt is founded in the concept of the redemption of evil and the exaltation of Pharaoh. Now, it used to be for all mankind, but, uh, but they turned the ordinances of exaltation into those allowed, uh, those that only Pharaoh could participate. The ordinances of exaltation are often manifest in the Egyptian religion, carved into the walls and written on papyrus. Now, the ordinances of exaltation, even in our own temples, are the ordinances of the firstborn. They make everyone a firstborn into God, if you are true and faithful and righteous. Everyone can, can be considered a firstborn of God. That's how we become an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ, the firstborn. And that's what it tells us in John chapter 1, that, that Christ came in order to give all of us in order to give power to become the sons of God, power to become. You know, the, the call to the altar of God is by invitation only, not by commandment. It's not something that we're forced into. And so that's why Christ gives us the power to become, because it's our choice. Satan's plan, if you think of it, Satan's plan was to make sure that not one soul would be lost which means Satan's plan was to make sure that no one could sin. God's plan, on the other hand, is to make sure everyone can sin if they want to. But he has provided, as John says, he's provided everything that's required, everything that's needed for our salvation, if we want it. Well, Abraham tells us in his book that Pharaoh signifies king by royal blood there in Abraham chapter 1. But if you read the word Pharaoh... In Egyptian, you can see it up there on the upper left. It's per were. That's the hieroglyphic there. That's a, that's per this this that rectangle is per with the door open. That's house. That's the word for house. And were down below it is is the word for great, and it means great house in Egyptian. Now you remember Joseph. You have to keep in mind Joseph is giving us this information before Egyptian is even cracked. Before there's a grammar for Egyptian, or an alphabet for Egyptian. It's being worked on at the same time in England and France, but he's given us this information before it's even before anybody even has a, a, an ability to understand Egyptian. And so Egypt, uh, Egyptologists know from the hieroglyphics that Perwer means great house. Joseph is telling us 
that Pharaoh signifies king by royal blood. Blood is the house. Royal is great. It's the exact same thing that he's saying. Now we learn from, from um, the book of Abraham in chapter one. Now the king of Egypt was a descendant from the loins of Ham and was a partaker of the blood of the Canaanites by birth. From this descent sprang all the Egyptians and thus the blood of Canaanites was preserved in the land um, uh, and sprang all the Egyptians and it was preserved. Now this, this descendant we learn is a grandson of Ham uh, or many's. The land of Egypt being first discovered by a woman who was the daughter of Ham and the daughter of Egyptus, which in the Chaldean signifies Egypt, which signifies that which is forbidden. When the woman discovered the land, it was underwater, who afterwards settled her sons in it, and thus from Ham sprang that race which preserved the curse of the land. Now, if you go back in the oldest myths and traditions of Egypt, if you go back into the oldest ones, uh, Egypt is founded by a woman, and this is a picture of her in both corners, Hathor or Hathor, which you will often see uh, the Pharaoh's nursing on the udder of the cow of Hathor or Hathor. And that's later stylized into Isis down below in the lower right-hand corner. You can see by the, the sun disk and the horns there that uh, she represents the first person who settled Egypt. And it, it's interesting that uh, her son, she, pre she put her son on the throne of Egypt. A woman discovers it. She places her, her son on the throne of Egypt. And his name is Min. M-I-N, his name is Min, and he becomes the first Pharaoh. And so every Pharaoh um, that we see depicted is always nursing on Hathor. He gets his right to reign from the mother or the matriarch who, who settled Egypt. And Hathor, or, or Isis in the lower right-hand corner, becomes the wife of Aver, uh, the symbolic wife of every Pharaoh because that first woman legitimizes the Pharaoh's reign in Egypt. Now you can see the genealogy from Adam all the way down to Ham and Abraham tells us the first government of Egypt was established by Pharaoh, the eldest son of Egyptus, the daughter of Ham. And it was after the manner of the government of Ham, which was patriarchal, telling us that the government of Egypt was based upon the patriarchal order. And it was because the matriarch plays a key part in that patriarchal order. And that's why Egyptian pharaohs, that's why everybody looks back to that first woman who discovered Egypt, uh, the pharaohs do. And that's why even in the Old Testament, the matriarch plays a key role in the choosing of the patriarch. And so we see this genealogy, Ham down in the lower uh, right, who has Cush, Mitzrayim, Punt, and Canaan. Mitzrayim is the word for Egy Egypt or Egyptus. That's the same connection who settles Egypt in our Old Testament. So we learn from Abraham, the government was set up after the manner of the patriarchal order. It was a system that Pharaoh knew and was familiar with. He knew and understood it because endowments were given not in temples anciently, but in, in, in the family tent, in the family home. And Abraham tells us that that first Pharaoh was a righteous man and sought earnestly to imitate. And Pharaoh being righteous knew that the patriarchal form of government was the best, the most inspired and the God-given form of government. And this system was a matril what's called a matrilineal patriarchy as it is in Gen Genesis. The matriarch always chooses who the new patriarch's gonna be. As we see in the case with uh, um, Jacob and Esau coming to Isaac, it's the matriarch who chooses, Sarah chooses uh, with Abraham who the patriarch, new patriarch's gonna be. We see Eve calling uh, or saying that now I've got a man child from the Lord and who it's gonna be. So. Uh, the story of the nativity in, in, in Luke that we always quote at Christmas time isn't the story of, isn't supposed to be the story of Christ's birth, but it's the story of Mary to prove that he is the Messiah. I mean, and the story of Mary is the prophecies. Uh, Isaiah, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Uh, Alma and Nephi both say that there is a virgin that's white above all others and her name shall be called Mary. The matrilineal patriarchy is one that we often don't look at, but it's very important. Now, Abraham tells us also in chapter 1, verse 26, that Pharaoh is a righteous man, established his kingdom, and judged his people wisely and justly all his days, seeking earnestly to imitate that order. Not just the patriarchal order, but he's now talking about the religious order. Seeking earnestly to imitate that order, the religion established by the fathers in the first generations, in the days of the first patriarchal reign, even in the reign of Adam and also of Noah, his father, who blessed him with the blessings of the earth and the blessings of wisdom, but cursed him pertaining to the priesthood. So 
The government of Egypt is set up on the patriarchal order. The religion of Egypt is set up on the patriarchal religion. So Pharaoh, being a righteous man, judged his people wisely and justly all his days. He established his kingdom and sought earnestly to imitate the religion of the patriarchs. Which religion of the patriarchs is not the Mosaic law? It's prior. It's pre-Mosaic law. It's based upon the ordinances of exaltation. He did this even though he didn't have the priesthood or the authority because he knew it was right and he was a righteous man. And who wouldn't, being righteous, take that which he knew was true and correct and earnestly imitate it? He knew it was the only true religion. Another thing we learned in Abraham. Now, Pharaoh being by that lineage, he could not have the right of the priesthood, notwithstanding he would... Um, notwithstanding, the pharaohs would fain claim it from Noah through Ham. Therefore, my father was led away by their idolatry, telling us that the pharaohs would claim, fain claim, their authority to rule and reign on earth by their genealogy. You see, this is a uh, statue of Ramses at Memphis, and Memphis is the place not only where where uh, Abraham was, but it's the same city where Joseph was. It's the city where Moses grew up. Uh, um, Memphis is here, and, and it, it was the capital of Egypt for a number of years. Um, but this is a statue of Ramses, and you see that thing that he's holding in his hand. That's a scroll going coming back to Abraham in this, in this verse uh, 25 through 27 in chapter 1. Uh, they would fain claim that right of the priesthood. That scroll, that scroll in his hand is his line of authority, which we call, that's the phrase we use in the church. That is going back, showing his genealogy that he has the right to reign. And every statue you see of Pharaoh with his legs apart, as they are here, which means he's alive, is showing his line of authority. He's holding that line of authority. And that's what we're seeing right there. Notwithstanding, the pharaohs would fain claim it from Noah, and that's his cartouche on the end of that scroll, giving his family line, his, his genealogy. So the government of Egypt was patterned after patriarchal, or the religion of Egypt was an imitation of the religion of the patriarchs. The Egyptian religion was patterned after the ordinances and doctrines of a higher order, those of exaltation, not just salvation, but those of exaltation, while the religion of ancient Israel under the Mosaic law functioned from an, an ironic order, the temple, the temple in Israel was an Aaronic temple governed by the, the president of the Aaronic priesthood, like a bishop. We participate in a similar temple in our wards. Our bishop is the president of the Aaronic priesthood, making sure that the emblems of the sacrifice of Christ or the Paschal Lamb are made available to all of Israel. It's an all y'all come church if you want to look at it that way, while the temple is a little bit different. There needs to be a recommend. And the Egyptian temples were patterned after the higher order, while Israel, the temple of, in Israel, was patterned after an Aaronic order. Well, temples, and we need to understand the purpose of the temples. The waters covered the face of the earth, and God said, let the dry land uh, appear. And the dry land came out, to, uh, out, out of the waters of creation. Now, this becomes very important because it's connected to the Egyptian religion, all religions, basically. And all temples, ancient as well as modern, as well as LDS. This primordial mound becomes the highest, the closest point between heaven and earth. It's called the primordial mound, the primeval hillock, or the axis of the earth, the axis mundi, the axis of the earth, sometimes called the navel of the earth, the world mountain, or center of the earth, the stone of creation. Those are all names for that primordial mound that comes out of the waters of creation. And that point becomes the closest point between heaven and earth. The ancients believe that that's where God came down and stood in order to finish the rest of creation. That being the closest point becomes the most sacred site. And so altars are constructed um, as a pattern of the primordial mound. We see this with uh, Elijah. He takes the 12 unhewn stones and earth and then digs a ditch around it and then pours water over that and fills the ditch. So you have this primordial mound, this altar coming out of this, this sea of water where God comes down and consumes the sacrifice. And so this primordial mound becomes very important. Altars are constructed there. And it's the point where all six cardinal directions come together uh, of our life, of this earth, is north and south and east and west. Uh, but it's where the three worlds, then the, the two other cardinal directions are up and down, the world of the gods and the world of the living. And that point where these altars are and temples are constructed is where time and space cease to exist and where the three uh, worlds can come together. Uh, when the London temple was dedicated, 
the first presidency published a pamphlet for the dedication for people to come to. And in that pamphlet, um, the first presidency said, or it was said in the pamphlet, that temples are constructed to maintain sacred space, the sacred space of the altar, because all covenants are made at the altar. So as the water becomes more, more as the world becomes more profane, then a building needs to be constructed to maintain the sacred space of the sacred space surrounding the altar, uh, because that's where the covenants are made. That's what represents the closest point between heaven and earth. This point, this the six cardinal directions is important because this is where the three worlds come together. This is why people in the world of the living can do work for people in the world of the dead that can be bound in the world of the gods. It's where all places come together. In Egypt, this concept was throughout Egypt and throughout their myth and history. The burial grounds or the burial places of the Egyptians, if you go back far in time, were, were what's called a mastaba. This is a picture of a mastaba. It's a it's an artificial primordial mound uh, because you have to be you want to be buried in the closest point between heaven and earth. It's what uh, Saqqara is. Uh, King Zoser built uh, Mastaba on top of Mastaba on top of Mastaba. And this is the oldest pyramid uh, in the world. Um, and this is the first pyramid. It's called the Step Pyramid. Well, as the pharaohs came along a little bit later, they actually face that pyramid, turning it into a pyramid shape, which eventually becomes the pyramids that we see today. And they represent that Mastaba. They represent that primordial mound. They represent the place where the three worlds come together. Um, and they all come together there, the world of the dead, the world of the living, and the world of the gods. And that's where you want to be buried. Even our, our tombstones are in, the sh in, in most places are in the shape of a primordial mound. That's why they're rounded at the top. Or they're like an altar or like a bed. A bed is an altar. It's where people are conceived. It's where they're born. It's where they live. It's where they die. It's where they uh, are resurrected from, buried from. There's lots of, we can go into that for a long time. But the pyramid represents these uh, these these primordial mounds. The concept of the primordial mound is seen in ancient and modern temples and sacred sites around the world, and that's what they represent: the primordial mound for the burial of the person. And you can see these different types of primordial mounds. These are temples around the world, each one representing a mountain or primordial mound. Uh, even as you come down to our temples, there's temple complexes throughout the world with the pyramids and each one representing that primordial mound, the ziggurat, and even our temple, even the scriptures bring this together when it talks about the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains. Uh, every temple represents that primordial mound. The earthly, earthly representation of this primordial mound or center of the earth has always been the temple, which all will, always will be associated with the creation. Each temple represents the creation and needs to symbolize that creation. This is the temple of Karnak in, in Luxor. It's one of the largest temples, over 200 acres. It's a temple complex, but it represents the creation. It rep and all temples represent that creation. Brigham Young stated that no two temples should be constructed exactly alike because they have to represent the creation. And to create is not to copy. God is not a copier. He's a creator. And each temple needs to represent the creation. And each temple is either built on a hill or there's a what's called a temenos, an artificial mound is, is constructed. And then the temple constructed on that artificial mound, like in Salt Lake and other temples, because they have to represent that primordial mound and they all represent the creation. That's, that's why zoos were always around the te ancient temples. That's why botanical gardens were constructed around temples. And the grounds are there because they have to represent that Garden of Eden after the creation. That's why water is always associated with temples, either, either in reflecting pools to see the temple in the different worlds, the world of the living and the world of the dead, or to the fountains of the waters of life that are, that are connected to those temples. So water, uh, it's, the creation is always an aspect of it. Now remember, Pharaoh being a righteous man, sought earnestly to imitate that order. The oldest written document in the world is called a Shabaka stone. And you have it right there in London. It's in the British Museum. As you go into the British Museum and you get, they generally lay out the museums and it has been in the past when I, when I was last there at the British Museum. They start with the oldest first. And this is the first thing you see when you walk into the Egyptian collection. 
It's the Shabaka stone. It's the oldest written document on the world and goes back to the first Pharaoh, Menes. Goes back. It was. It was, and it's and it's written in drama and in, in in as a drama. It's written as a play to be acted out in the temple of Menes in Memphis. Um, it's the oldest written document of the world that we have. The Shabaka stone was written as a drama or play and was meant to be performed in the te uh, in the temple. And it talks about these things. It even gives stage directions. It says so and so shall enter from the left and say. And so-and-so enters from the right and says this. It gives not only stage directions, but it gives uh, the dialogue. But it talks about the spiritual creation of the earth. It talks about the council of the gods getting together as described in the book of Abraham. It talks about the council in heaven deciding what plan and who's going to be in charge. And there's two brothers that are fighting to be the god of this world. So it talks about those and who's going to be chosen. And it says in the text itself, that Ptah, who is the father God, chooses his most beloved son to be the God of the world, to be to be, be the God for this world. The brother seeks to destroy him and ends up killing him when he's here in mortality. He ends up killing Osiris. That's the manifestation of the beloved son. Kills Osiris. Osiris is then resurrected, giving all resurrected and exalted, giving all the power to become resurrected and exalted later on. And it says in here that the, the God, Ptah, created the world and all things in it by the word of his power, by the word of his mouth. You can't get much closer than this. Each temple represents the primordial of the mound and therefore the creation and the coming together, the world of the gods, the world of the living and the world of the dead. Christ talks about these three worlds in the scripture when he's talking about what we do in the temple. In Matthew 16, he says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're all familiar with that. We often will say that Peter is revelation or that rock is revelation, which it is in part. But Joseph Smith says that rock is Christ. And if anybody knows what Christ was talking about, it's Peter. And Peter in his book, in four verses, brings up these things about that rock. He says that Christ in the atonement is a living stone. It's the chief cornerstone. It's a stone disallowed. It's the head of the corner. It's a stone of stumbling for those who reject it and a rock of offense for those who, who love darkness more than light. Peter is telling us that the stone is Christ. That primordial amount is Christ in the atonement. Now, if you look at this in the Greek and it says, and remember, it says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is what it says in the Greek. This is what it says when you really look at it. I say unto thee that thou art a Petros, now, Petros is a small stone, like a seer stone. And he says, you're a small stone, Peter, but upon this Petra, upon this stone of creation, upon the center of the world, upon the navel of the earth, upon Christ and the atonement, am I going to build my church? And then it says, and the gates of Hades. It doesn't say hell in the translation. It says Hades. Well, Hades is the spirit world. He says, and the gates of the spirit world, the world of the dead, because I'm going to build it upon Christ, the world of the dead will not be able to remain closed, will not be able to prevail against those in the world of the dead, will not be able to prevail against the spirit world. That because the church is going to be built upon Christ and the atonement, the spirit world will not be able to hold in those spirits forever. And then the question is why? Why are the gates of the spirit world not going to be able to hold it? He gives us that answer in the next verse, connecting the three worlds. And I will give it unto thee the king's kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth. Now remember, the context is the dead. For the living and the dead, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, for the living and the dead, shall be bound in heaven. That's the world of the gods. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, for the living and the dead, shall also be loosed in heaven. This passage is not is talking about the three worlds, but it's not talking about revelation. It's talking about temple work. It's talking about ordinances and keys that are going to be given so that people can be sealed in this world. Uh, even though they were dead, they can be sealed in this world to be sealed in eternity and in heaven. It's talking about temple work. Christ brings together priesthood keys and creation and the unification of the three worlds through the atonement and through the resurrection. This is really the function and purpose of the temples, to bring priesthood keys, connect those keys with the creation of why we're here, 
What is our purpose in life? And then the unification of the three worlds to give us answers through the atonement and resurrection. If you think about what an endowment of power is, and I've got a whole presentation on this, if what, what the, an endowment of power really is, it's not necessarily the ordinances that we participate in the temple. The endowment of power is knowledge. It's knowing that we existed before we came here. It's knowing that there's a purpose to life. It's knowing that there is an atonement and resurrection. It's knowing where evil comes from. It's knowing how to control that evil. It's knowing what our potential is. It's knowing that there's life after death. It's knowing that we can repent and come unto God. It's knowing that eternity exists. It's knowing that we can be with families and spouses for eternity. See, that give, that's an endowment of power over mortality. That gives us an endowment of power that nobody else has. That's really what the endowment of power is, is knowledge. It's not ordinances. There's only like four ordinances we actually participate in the temple. And they're based upon our faithfulness. The power, the power of the reality of any ordinance is based upon our change of character. But the knowledge that's given there is what gives us a power over mortality, a power over this life that people throughout the world are searching for. It's in the temple where time and space cease to exist. Here the three worlds are able to come together, the closest point of heaven and earth. And this is why and where the living can do work for the dead that will be binding in the world of the gods. Temples in Egypt, there's, there's two different types of temples in the Middle East, straight axis and bent axis temple. Egypt is almost all straight axis temple. Straight axis is if you come in the front door and keep going, you'll come right to the Holy of Holies. That's a straight axis temple. You come in and you keep going straight. Now, I want you to look at this picture in Egypt, I hope, or this temple in Egypt. The water, if you can see my cursor, by these pylons up at the top of the picture, these, these, these high walls are pylons. The river, the water used to come right up to them. There's a dock right there for the, God, for the uh, uh, idol to go out on the waters, but that water is there. This pylon, as it goes up and it comes down, this pylon represents, that's the Egyptian hieroglyphic for the primordial mound, the first uh, dry land that comes out of the waters of creation. And then it was open in this part, uh, this center courtyard that you can see just this side of, the, of those high walls. That's the open courtyard. That was open. That was the creation room. And then you go into the hypostyle hall, which is next, which is the garden room, each column representing a plant or a type of plant. That's the garden room until eventually you come to where the tree of life is, the highest point, the holy of holies, the, the, the sanctuary, if you want to call it that, at the highest point. This is important. This is this is this is a model of it. Here you have the pylons out on the left, representing the, there had been water beyond that, further to the left. The water would come right up to there. These pylons representing the primordial mound. You have the open courtyard, which represents the creation room. And it's interesting that you always have three little temples there, three shrines there: one for the heavenly father, one for a heavenly mother, and one for the son, the most beloved son. Then, as you continue in. Then you have a roof after this part. Here's the hypostyle hall with the columns representing the garden room. And as you continue on, then you'll get to the sanctuary here in the center. Again, a straight axis, all leading up to the Holy of Holies where the God resides. If you look at this, this is a depiction of every Egyptian temple. This is uh, um, actually the one at Karnak or uh, Luxor. Um, if you look at this, now I want you to look at the ground. Here it's, you see where, where it's not dark above. That's where it's all open. The water would have been out here on the left. You have the primordial mound. You have the creation room. You come into the garden area and then finally the sanctuary. But I want you to look what's happening. The ground is going, getting higher each time. You're rising up this mound. You're rising up this primordial mound until you get to where the sanctuary. At the same time, the, the sky, the heavens get lower and lower. So you have it open, and then you have a ceiling here, and then it gets lower, and then it gets lower. And then on the top of the ceiling in the sanctuary, it's always painted in blue and carved with stars on the top of it, this becoming the closest point between heaven and earth, where covenants are made, where man communes with God. Those are the key things. that It becomes the closest point between heaven and earth, and that's looking right through this same temple, and you can see the Holy of Holies. That dark door in the very back is the Holy of Holies on that. Uh, and this is a picture of different holies of holies, uh, different temples, uh, where the god was and uh, or where the uh, idol was. It would have been Amun in most of the places here. 
on the outside of the Holy of Holies at that same temple, on the outside, there is depicted the ordinances that the Pharaoh has to go through in order to participate, uh, in order to become a son of God. And there's four main vignettes at the top as well as others, but the four main vignettes are the highest and most important. And there is a washing, an anointing, an acceptance, a presentation, and then entrance into the presence of God. Here you can see it here. There's a washing of water on the, on the left. There's the anointing of the oil, the seven parts of the body they call the, the blows of life. The acceptance, he's been true and faithful in all things. Then Thoth is doing the presentating uh, of, the, of the person, as well as, I mean, you have the, these are the escorts or the guides. Thoth is doing the presentation. And then the fi final one is the Pharaoh in the presence of God, in the presence of Amun. So you have these three different ones. And here you can see the washing and the anointing a little closer that's, being, that's taking place. Uh, the acceptance, he's proven himself in all things, and then the presentation. And then finally, in the presence of God, where God is giving him the blessings, the very powers that make God God. That's our moon in this particular. Uh, below this, we see the God is always covered by a veil. That's uh, there, you. When you see this on the outside, it's interesting because there's always this veil cloth, even though the, the building, the the uh, the container, the ark itself would not be, you wouldn't be able to see him because of that, but they always put a veil over, over him. So this is the washings of the waters of life. Uh, we see in many, and this is the anointing with the oil. They would anoint the person on the different parts of the body from the head down to the feet, um, the, the nose, the mouth, the chest, so that, so that those parts of the body would function correctly in a celestial resurrection when he comes forth out of the grave. Well, anyway, um, that's the gospel in Egypt. I've gone through it uh, pretty fast. Um, we didn't get into some of the uh, things that will really change your life uh, or change your outlook on the gospel in Egypt, like the sacred embrace and the ritual embrace, but um, maybe there might be another time. Remembering that Budge wrote, there never was a people more prepared to accept Christianity than were the ancient Egyptians. The important thing you need to know is that I know and understand. Joseph could not have come up with these things that we have. He couldn't have done it. That first Pharaoh, there's similarities there because that first Pharaoh was a righteous man and sought earnestly to imitate that order. Things go by diffusion. There's two theories of the way that religions, that why there's so many different religions. One was uh, purported by, uh, by a mythologist, um, I'm trying to remember his name, uh, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, he was an atheist. He was, but he's not anymore. He's, he's passed away. But Joseph Campbell was an atheist. And he did more study on the myths of different cultures than anybody else. And he realized that the same myth was everywhere in every ancient culture, that there's a father God. He has a son uh, that's most beloved. That son is hated by a brother and, is in, and, and ends up being killed by his brother. And that the beloved son rises again, is resurrected again, giving hope and salvation to mankind for life after death. He recognized this, this that it was everywhere. He even wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces because it's the same story with a thousand different names. But being an atheist, he didn't know, he didn't know, how to, he didn't know what to do with this. So he said that, that because uh, we evolved, he felt that we evolved. And he said, because man evolves, the, the religion of man evolves the same way. Therefore, the same story is going to show up when it's unrelated in time and space. Well, the other, the other theory is, is diffusionism, which we know is true. And diffusionism is that the first man uh, received his religion and faith from God. And then it diffuses through the rest of time. That, that diffuses down through time and through time and wickedness and change. Um, uh, things are changed. Names are changed. Even ordinances are changed. And so that's, we know that that's right. Now, if, if that's true, which we know it is because of our Pearl of Great Price, then the best way you can look at the original religion from a secular point of view is to go back as far in time to the most ancient culture that there is and look at what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that's Egypt. That's Egypt. The next place would be Mesopotamia. And so that first Pharaoh, being a righteous man, sought earnestly to imitate that order. And this is why Budge, the curator of the Egyptian collection there in London, said there was never a people more prepared to accept Christianity than were the ancient Egyptians. Joseph didn't know anything about Egypt. He didn't know anything about Jerusalem. 
And the things that he gave us are connected directly back to Adam and the things that Adam's received. And know that I know that these things are true, that Joseph is a prophet, that he gave us these things. That, and these things are inspired. These things that we have, our religion, our salvation, and our exaltations are concepts that go back to the very beginning of Adam. There was an ancient text discovered called the Apocalypse of Adam. And in it says, Christ appears to Adam after the fall. And he says, and Adam said, and Christ says to Adam in this ancient text, he says, you wanted to be a God and I will make you a God, but not now, not now, not yet. You must die and I will be born of your prodigy. I need to come. And then the time will come that I'm resurrected and you will be resurrected. And then he says, and I will set you on the right hand of my divinity and make you a God as you wanted to be. I mean, there's so many ancient texts out there that discuss this concept, these concepts. There's the, the the council in heaven is unreal and shows up in multiple texts. And we're the only faith that really believes in a pre-earth life, a council in heaven and a purpose. Uh, almost every other faith believes that our existence began at our birth and that eternity begins at birth. Uh, but there are multiple ancient texts uh, that talk about the council in heaven, the war in heaven, the spirits that were there, um, how Satan was cast out. Um, and these are all things that are just phenomenal that Joseph could not have come up with uh, without revelation. Know that I know that Jesus is the Christ and all these things testify of him. He is the rock. Know that I know that Joseph is a prophet for he could not have done what he has done. We talk about the fruits of a prophet. Well, the fruits of the prophet of Joseph Smith are not necessarily the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham. The fruits of the prophet Joseph Smith are 16 plus million members trying to be better people than they ever were before. Those are the fruits of the prophet Joseph Smith. And by the fruits, you know them. Uh, know that I know that Joseph is a prophet of God, that the Book of Abraham is a real text, as is the Book of Mormon, the Bible, and the Doctrine and Covenants. And this I say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's back to you. Brother Porter, that was absolutely amazing and uh, a real a real eye-opener. Eye um, and uh, we've, got a, we've got a few questions for you now, if that's okay. Yes, please. So, so a little bit about you and uh, some about other subjects. So where and how did your interest in church history and scripture start? I, I grew up with my grandparents and I lived on a cattle ranch. It was about a hundred, a little 120,000 acres. And it was in the middle of nowhere. And we didn't, we didn't get electricity until I was 16. Well, growing up with my grandmother, she, every night, she was an avid reader of the Book of Mormon. And every night she read the Book of Mormon on my bedside to me. And by the time I was seven years old, she had gone through the Book of Mormon at least five times. And living on the ranch without electricity, she was kind of in control of the books I read. And so they, they, they were nothing but commentaries on scripture and church books. And I, I remember begging her for the heart to read the Hardy Boys or something else or, or, or Nancy Drew or something like that. I, I used to beg for that. But, but all she gave me was, was scripture books and, and doctrinal books. And so by the time I went on my mission to England there, I had already gone through Sperry's Book of Mormon Compendium three times with notes in the margins and things like that. And when I got there, all I did is uh, all my spare time was, was reading scriptures and reading uh, commentaries, what I could, um, uh, English commentaries on the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and reading these commentaries, I realized that that different commentators had different opinions on on different verses. And so I decided that I didn't, I, I probably need, I needed the commentaries, but I didn't want to rely on the commentaries. And so I decided that I, I wanted to study the ancient languages. And so I, off to Israelite, I went with my wife and young boy and uh, to study Hebrew at Hebrew University. And um, so I could read the Old Testament in its original language. And then I decided I, I needed to study Greek. So I studied Greek and then um, Aramaic. There's books written in Aramaic. So I studied Aramaic. And then um, there's New Testament texts written in Coptic. So I studied Coptic. And I, I knew that Abraham lived in Ur Chaldee. So I studied uh, Chaldean and Ugaritic and Akkadian. And um, I knew he was in Egypt for a while. So I decided to study Egyptian and 
and so I did that. I I did that for tools to understand scripture better, and uh, those languages in that scripture actually. Uh, I was sent by the church for almost eight months into Europe and the Middle East just to do research on the Book of Abraham uh, to locate the will of Labelo. I spent 45 days in the British Museum Library, if you can imagine that. I mean, <laughs> imagine 45 days in the same library, but but I, I doing research on Abraham. Uh, but it's because I love Scripture. When I was, I did a lot of research for the church. They would have me do specialized scriptural research, and they told me I could use three sources. Those three sources were: I could use the standard works, I could use the teachings of Joseph Smith, and I could use the words of the prophet while he was prophet, if they agreed with the other two. And those were my sources. And so I do that to a fault. I use the scriptures. I use Joseph Smith and I use the words of a prophet while they were prophet. Uh, because they have told us that if anybody high or low in the church, and this, they've said this multiple times, anybody high or low in the church, including the prophet, teaches anything contrary to the scriptures, you can rest assured it's their own opinion. If we don't have a standard, you don't have a standard. And so I do that to a fault. But my desire and my desire to know and understand, came to use what was available as tools to understand the scriptures and the word of God. I hope that answers the question. So, Yeah, I think very much so. Um, <clears throat> what advice or suggestions would you give to those wanting to delve deeper into scripture and ancient languages? Scripture, you have to have a standard. When I was doing, when I was working at universities or studying at universities, people would come to me and say, how do you keep your faith when these professors are teaching you so many other things that are contrary to the scriptures? You know, the critical view, biblical criticism uh, tries to belittle what's in, in the scriptures themselves. And they would say, how do you keep your faith? There's a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, that says that we learn by study and also by faith. And that was the answer that I would give them. It's not it's, it's not what I'm learning that's most important. It's the faith that I have that is. And when I hear things that don't agree with Scripture, see, I, I would tell these people that would ask me that question, I have a standard. I have given, my, the, I have given the authority that I use to those Scriptures, to God and what He's given us. And everything else is the arm of flesh. And if it doesn't agree with those Scriptures, then it goes on the back burner until I can find a way that it does agree. And so you have to have a standard. You, if you don't, you're going to fall. If you don't have that standard, you're going to fall. And so that's how I was able to get through college and these classes with professors who didn't believe in God, uh, who were teaching things contrary to the scriptures. I, I played their game. There's no question you have to do that. But you have to establish that standard. And it can't be in the arm of flesh, as the scriptures tell us. It can't be in the arm of flesh. There's a there's a, a great quote that says that men's ideas come and go. What a man says is the final word on a subject in six months' time will not be the final word. There will be another one. And we can't hold God to the same standards that we hold mankind to. We can't hold God to what people or man says needs to happen because Man speaks in a temporal environment, and God speaks from an eternal perspective. And so we have to have that standard. And so the best thing to do is first get a standard, and then pick your field that you want to go into and go into it. And England, believe me, the universities there have some of the best classes and education that a person can get in Scripture. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, where has been your favorite place to visit and why? <laughs> Home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends on the time of the year, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I went to school. I went to school in, in Israel at Hebrew University for a while, and I had a daughter born in Jerusalem there. And at certain times of the year, Israel is one of my most, um, favorite places. Um, uh, just because I know it, it's like a second home to me. I, um, I'm known around town. People know me. I've been going back. I've been going to Israel since 1975, since 76. I've been going to Egypt that long too, but I've been going there for a long time. And I've watched people grow up. They know me. I go. I can't hardly walk the streets within 
uh, in certain areas that people don't come up to me or try and give me things or, you know, gifts or presents, candy, food, whatever, you know. So um, I really like Israel because, uh, because of what happened there. I've discovered, though, um, people tell me, and I take a lot of tours. I've taken thousands and thousands of people on tours and lectures. I do lectures over there. People will always say, you know, that I really felt the spirit, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane or the Garden Tomb or even in the Sacred Grove in New York. People say, I really felt the spirit there. And it used to frustrate me, you know, how, how, why are they feeling the spirit at these places? I, I knew the Holy Ghost didn't take residence you know, didn't live in the in the Garden of Gethsemane or didn't live at the Garden Tomb or the Sacred Grove. I, I knew that. And I, I was wondering about it. And I was sitting in my sacrament meeting one time uh, in my own home ward. And I was wondering about this. And during the sacrament prayer, it just it hit me like a ton of bricks. It just slapped me upside the face there. When in the prayer, it said that you do always remember him that you might have his spirit to be with you. And then it hit me. That's my answer. When we go to these places, no matter where it is or where our favorite place might be, it's not that the spirit's necessarily there. I mean, he's there. I mean, he's there's a spirit about a place, but it's because we shut out of our mind the everyday world and we're contemplating on the events that happen there. And doing that, that opens the door to our heart and mind for the spirit or the Holy Ghost to come in and bear witness that those events are true. And I learned very quickly that I can have a sacred experience in my own sacrament meeting setting on my pew that I'd like to put my name on, that I can have just a sacred experience there as I can in the Garden of Gethsemane or the Garden Tomb or the Sacred Grove or the Hill Cumorah. And so <laughs> where is my favorite place? There's an, an old saying that here is where I'm at. Missionaries come often and they will say that even in their late years that the mission was the best two years of their life. Well, if that's the case, I really feel sorry for him. I really feel sorry for him because the last year of my life should be the best year of my life spiritually. It should have been last year, not 40 years ago. It should have been last year, it should have been the best year of my life. And where is my favorite place? <laughs> it's really wherever I'm at. I, I don't mind being anywhere in the world. I hate getting there, but I don't mind being anywhere in the world. But I do love Israel. I do like Egypt. They think I'm an Egyptian when I go there sometimes. Uh, um, but um, I've been to some of the most, in my opinion, sacred sites in the world. In Turkey, I've been to all seven churches of the Book of Revelation in Turkey. I've been all over Europe, Rome, you know, the big cathedrals and everywhere. I mean, you've got one of the best cathedrals around right there in, in your town. So, but here's where I'm at. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just talking about Israel there, um, seeing that there's, there's just a slight rise uh, in Christianity in Israel. Where, where, where would you say the church is at in terms of its relationship with Israel, with Israeli people? You know, there, there is a Jewish movement, uh, Messianic Jews. There is a Jewish movement, Christian movement going among the Jews. There's, um, there's, there's Christians that have been there in Palestine. The Palestinian Christians have been there for a long time. The, one of the first churches to come into Israel was the Armenian church. Then, of course, the Catholic church after that, and, and then the Coptic and, and some of the others. But but the the Christian Palestinians have been there for a long time, and some of them date their Christianity back to the time of Christ. Um, so far as in, in, in Jerusalem or Israel itself as a state, uh, the church has a presence there because um, they could prove that there were missionaries there before uh, 1948, and there were missionaries there in the 1800s in Haifa and they're buried there. And so that allowed our Jewish law for the church to have a presence there. Now, the Jerusalem Center is the church's presence there, but they are under restriction. They don't, uh, in Israel, nobody owns the land and the church only leases the land that the Jerusalem Center is on. They, it's in the Palestinian area, but they purchased it from all the Palestinians who owed, owned it at one time and Israel leases it to them but it's under the restriction that they not proselyte in any way. Uh, proselyting is against the law in Israel. 
Uh, and so they can't proselyte. They can have cultural missionaries or, or those that help health missionaries and others, uh, humanitarian. Um, and they have an education center there. But so far as proselyting goes, they can't do it. The church's presence, uh, presence is known there. Uh, it's respected there um, by both uh, Jews and um, Palestinians. And so um, it's, it's going to be there for a long time, I think, as long as, uh, as long as things are okay there. Now, many people will say, well, the church has to build, before Christ comes, the church has to build a temple on the Temple Mount. Um, in order for the church to build a temple on the Temple Mount, every Jew and every Muslim in the world would have to be dead. Um, <laughs> so, but it doesn't mean that they can't do that because we, we can turn almost any building into a temple you know, with dedication, with a little remodeling and dedication when the time comes. So don't think that we have to build a temple on the Temple Mount. But, um, but it can happen. Uh, the Jew, uh, uh, there could be an occupation um, uh, of the Temple Mount. Uh, even I think it's Ezekiel that says in the Old Testament that when they build this temple before the Messiah comes, when they build a temple, they'll build it on the old threshing floor on the north side of it, and then they'll put a wall between the house of the Lord and the house of the stranger. There'll be a fence or a wall there, so you could have both. But but after Christ comes, uh, the Latter-day Saints can take a take any building and turn it into a temple with a little bit of work and some dedication. Uh, no pun intended, but uh, it can be done. Uh, but we have a presence there. It's respected and it's known among both the, uh, the Jewish community and the Palestinian community. Mm, good. Um, is there anywhere you haven't had a chance to go yet, but would like to go? You know, I, my bucket is empty. Uh, my wife's bucket still is half full, so, <laughs> and I think I'm in her bucket. So um, there isn't anywhere, I mean, my wife's favorite place that she wants to go back to is England. I mean, she's been to, with me to Israel, I think in Egypt at least 12 or 14 times. So she's been there, done that. You know, I try and do something different each time I go. Her favorite place right now is England. Um, um, but I would, I, you know, I've been all over Europe. I've, the only place I haven't been is in the Far East and it's not, I don't, I mean, I've studied the religions of the Far East. Uh, I've, I've studied their faith, you know, from India and China and Japan. I'm familiar with all that, but I um, I don't have a big desire to go because I sometimes you Nibley used to say you can learn more about Egypt in the libraries in America than you can going to Egypt, and that's kind of the way I feel about the Far East right now. I mean, it, you go places for experiences, not some now rather than education, because education is doubling every you know 24 hours on the internet. Internet, so yeah, yeah, okay. But so I'm coming back. I'm, I'm coming back to England. That's where my that's that's on my wife's list. So. And yeah, and you were saying that you you're going to be doing some uh, church history tours over here. Yes. Did you, did you uh, there is um, you know there is church history here. What what? Yeah, talk about church history a little bit if you if you would sort of in the UK. You know, in the UK is there there's a lot. I mean, Joseph Smith said before he died he said that if if we don't get the saints if we don't if we don't gather the saints from england then this church will fail he said that the church's survival after the restoration the church's survival relied upon the saints in england and those that were going to immigrate to give the church strength in the in the 1850s when the pearl of great price the pearl of great price was published at the the address is 15 Walton Street in Liverpool. The Pearl of Great Price was published there uh, in the 1850s. The reason it was is because there hadn't been any Book of Mormons published since the time of Joseph Smith. There were 20,000 members of the church in the United States, 15,000 members in the Utah, Idaho, Arizona front. I call it the Mormon, the Mormon axis. Uh, of the West. There were 15,000 members there, a total of 20,000 members in the United States, a total of 58,000 members in England at the exact same time. 
and they didn't have anything to read. They were dying for things to read, and that's why um, that's why the Pearl of Great Price was published and put together um, in Liverpool so that they could get it to the saints. Um, you know, you have uh, Wilford Woodruff uh, going down to John Benbow's farm, not far from uh, Hereford, uh, going to John Benbow's farm and baptizing hundreds there. You have um, the brother in uh, Wilford as well as uh, um, Kimball and some of the others in uh, in Preston area teaching where some of the first bapti baptisms took place, uh, took place there on the river Ribble in Preston. I mean, you've got a, you've got a nice little statue there in the garden down by the, by the river Ribble. And you've got a statue on the docks of, of Liverpool uh, there at the, at, uh, what is it? The King Edward docks or whatever it's called there in Liverpool, you have the statue of the saints leaving uh, Liverpool. Um, so you've got a lot of church history in England that were not, uh, that a lot of people aren't aware of. And so when we come on, we're going to go to Bembo's farm. We're going to see the pond, even though there's not much there. We're going to see the pond where the baptisms took place. We're going to go into Liverpool and, and see the docks there and, and drive by where the Pearl of Great Price was. We're going to go to the, uh, um, we'll go up to the um, temple there in Preston and the uh, MTC and, um, go in through Preston, walk through Preston, the corner, the center, the uh, the square there where the early missionaries taught. We'll go down to the to the to the uh, house that they were renting when they saw the manifestation of all the powers of Satan trying to stop the work from going forth. And we'll walk down to the uh, to the river, and I mean, we'll do uh, a number of different things like that um, uh, while we're on that church history tour. So, as well as some of the better sites. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, coming back to what you were saying about just um you, you quoted budge a couple of times through what you were saying why were the egyptians so you know so sort of christian because of their myths their myth is that that there's a supreme god see we look at the egyptians and say well they have all these different gods they're pagans they have all these different gods well the different gods are really the manifestations of the attributes of the divine or the supreme god you know, you have a God of the resurrection, Anubis. You have a God of knowledge and understanding is Thoth. You know, you have these different gods, but they're really manifestations. They're manifestations of different attributes of God. But when you go back the furthest in time, the oldest myths and the oldest traditions, the oldest religion um, is, is really one supreme God. It's one father God called Ptah. And he's the one that creates everything by the word of his power. He's the one that chooses his most beloved son. And that most beloved son becomes Osiris. Uh, and sometimes depicted as Horus later on. But he comes as Osiris. And Osiris ends up being killed by his brother, his wicked brother, Set or Seth, who's jealous of his authority and jealous of his power. And he kills Seth. And he remains dead for a short time. And then he's resurrected and receives his glory, and then giving everyone the opportunity uh, to receive that same resurrection and that same exaltation. So the whole concept of Christ as a firstborn and the concept of resurrection and atonement, if, if, we, if we get another chance, I'll, I'll do a PowerPoint on the ritual embrace, but it is really the meaning of the atonement. The atonement, the atonement of Christ becoming one with God is the fundamental the foundation of the Egyptian religion when you begin to see it. And what we do in the temple is seen on the walls. I mean, the, the Pharaoh, before a person, before the Pharaoh could enter into the uh, Holy of Holies where the God was, he had to embrace the God. He had to put his hand on the shoulders and the shoulder and the God had to put his hand on his shoulder. And he was given what, what we would call the Abrahamic covenant. In the translation, it says, my beloved, and this is the translation, I endow thee, I bless thee, that the power that the priesthood is going to be on you and your descendants after you. I give you immortality and eternal life like God has for eternity. That's what's given in that ritual embrace in every temple in Egypt, every single one. Wow. And, and so Budge could easily say that the Egyptians were prepared to accept the traditions of Christ better than anybody else. Man. 
could you could you just if you're willing you, you and just pre uh, your presentation you were telling us the impact that your presentations had had on some of the egyptian people would you would you be willing to share that again just for the sort of more general audience yes i uh, i was at the temple of karnak and and there there is there a as you go into the the holy of holies there's two columns on the outside um and on and there's six depictions three on one side three on the back side six depictions on each column so a total of 12 of of the god uh, and the pharaoh embracing each other the feet are together the hands are on the shoulder um uh, of both and i you know, if we ever do another one i'll i'll actually show you the pictures of these things yeah. but uh, the god's one his hand is up like this i don't know if you can see that his hand is up like this facing him like that that means there's speaking going on and in that speaking they're giving they're giving what I call the Abrahamic covenant of priesthood and posterity and inheritance that we see in the Old Testament. Um, they're bestowing that upon Pharaoh. The, the God has to bestow the the powers that make God God on the individual, so he can come into the presence of God. He has to be that. And so one of the uh, guides, and you always have to have the local guides. The guide was there, and he was going through the history and stuff. And then he always would always turn the time over to me, and then. Then I started explaining what was going on and what was taking place and how the character of the Pharaoh, they, they call it the negative confessions in the Book of the Dead, um, how it mattered and what was taking place in this ritual embrace and how the powers were being passed from the God. It's called mutual embrace. The, the ritual embrace, there's a ritual embrace, which is ordinance. There's a sacred embrace, which is atonement. There's a mutual embrace where both the receiver and the giver receive power. And we see that in our own scriptures, our Doctrine and Covenants section 132 has a verse that just actually just jumps right out at you on that. But I started explaining that and our guide considered himself an ancient Egyptian believer, not a Muslim. And as I turned, as I turned around and to turn the time back over to him, he's just weeping. The tears are just coming down his face because he's hearing things and understanding things he hasn't uh, heard before or understood before from, from the walls of what he felt he understood. I was, um, I was going in a, I was in a papyrus shop and they always have the papyrus of Annie or one of the, uh, the judge, they call it the judgment scene. And I was going through the judgment scene because that was in, that was one of the facsimiles in our book of Abraham, in the book of Joseph. And three brethren had seen the manuscript of Joseph, uh, Elder McConkey, uh, James Talmage and Sidney B. Sperry. And they all said that the things contained in the book of Joseph were of such a sacred nature that they shouldn't be uh, revealed. And, and McConk, Elder McConkie went on to say that he felt that the things in the book of Joseph were, were what led to the restoration of the endowment at Nauvoo. And so, so they have these papyrus that are the judgment scene, like the one that, like the facsimile that would have been in the book of Joseph. And so I'm going over this papyrus, explaining where the dead person is and how his character is being judged and weighed and the great devourer there. And then what is said when he's presented, there's always a guide, uh, there's always an escort, and he's brought to the veil, he's brought to the veil, and then I, I read to him off the papyrus what, what is being said at the veil uh, by the escort to the God on the other side. And I mean, it, it's, it's just said, and, and to, well, I can't remember it exactly, but just to give you, it says this, this person, the dead person, um, um, he calls him the Osiris Annie, uh, the, the Osiris Annie, meaning that he's gone through everything. He's ready to become a god. He's be ready to become like Christ. He says this Osiris Annie uh, has been true and faithful. He's not sinned against any god or any goddess. Uh, he's done everything according to the counsel of the decree of the gods. And there's always, there's 12 gods setting up at the top who are in judgment over the dead. He says he's done everything according to the counsel of the decree of the gods. And then he said, and then at the end of that little vignette there it says may he enter after he's telling after he's after uh, horus explains to osiris on the other side that he's been true and faithful and everything he's done everything he's supposed to then then the horus the escort says to osiris on the side may he enter may he enter into your presence and become like the followers of osiris or horus forever that's in that presentation scene so i'm explaining this in this papyrus shop and the people are astounded and then all of the, the owners of the papyrus shop, all their laborers are all standing around the, my group. And when they disperse, the owner comes up to me and three or four of his people say, can you come over to my desk? I come over to his desk and he says, can you 
give me the book where you're getting this stuff from, where you're getting this information from. So I said, I can't give you the book because of law, but I can give you a website where you can go read it any, anytime you want. So, <laughs> um, I, 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 I've, you know, I've had a lot of guides, different guides in Egypt, and uh, they've all come away with a better understanding. And they give me understanding too, but uh, I give them something to think about. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, I think uh, I think we're about at the end of our questions. An absolutely huge, huge thank you for for uh, for coming on tonight and for for doing the presentation. We will definitely have you come again and talk about uh, the mutual embrace um, with us and do another presentation if you're willing to do that. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you as well next year when you come to England. Yeah, I, I, they, they'll send me as early as I want to go if I've got a. So I may, I may come early just so I can, maybe I could come see you or do something live for you. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be yeah. great. Yep. Okay. Um, we'd like to thank Brother Porter for his kindness in, in being with us today. Really enjoyed um, his remarks and some of the amazing things that he's talked about there. Um, we'd like to close with a word of prayer now, and I think it's going to be um, Brother Keith from the Litchfield Ward. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Our dear Father in Heaven, we're grateful for the opportunity we've had to listen to this wonderful fireside this evening. We know that thy spirit was with Elder Porter and with all those who have helped and collected together this work. We're grateful for the knowledge that we have and for the way that our knowledge can increase day by day. Please bless all those who have organised this fireside for us and help us to stay close to thee during the coming week. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Gordon. Okay, Brother Porsche, if you just hold for